You're trying to not confuse people on LPs. You want to really have a one track mind of like, this is what I'm selling you and this is why, as opposed to that scatter shot, which you can kind of see in some UGC where it's like, oh, it does this and it does this and you could use it for this. That's cool. But like, if I'm only one of those things or only interested in one of those things, I would rather see you say, you can use it for this and here's all the things that that'll change about your life when you do so. That person is going to be far more likely to want to go through all that content, want to run into that funnel than if you just say like, hey, we want to sell this to everybody. That's kind of the strategy that we've taken on LPs is like, you know, you do want to touch all your value props, but you really just want to put your best foot forward, give your best sales prop. This is why you need this. Content from real people equals instant credibility for your brand. Consumers today crave real connections with real people, and they're guarded about who they'll trust. Highly polished, branded content simply doesn't cut it anymore. Let MiniSocial build a network of powerful micro-influencers around your brand who all know and love your products. They'll create something compelling that resonates with their audience and deliver it directly to you for use across all your marketing channels. Yeah, that includes ads. Meet millennials and Gen Zers where they're already hanging out, in the feeds of their favorite influencers, and get started with mini social. Cam Bush, head of advertising at one of my favorite brands on the entire internet, Hexclad. Welcome to the D2C podcast. How you doing? I'm doing excellent. Thanks so much for having me, man. Yeah, man. You were just talking about what it's like working at a company at the scale you're at. And you're talking forest from from trees. So just how do you describe the scale and your responsibilities kind of within that at Hexclad? You know, re- responsibilities that I that I technically have versus the ones that I feel like I have uh, are are probably a little skewed. But I'd say you know I'm attempting to as a you know somebody with a media buying background with a nitty gritty growth consulting background coming from Homestead and you know scaling dozens of brands, um, you really get drilled into that minutia. And I think that wrapping our arms around like, you know, the US as a market versus Facebook versus Google and and all of the little ticky tacky channels is, I mean, it, it's a struggle. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I think where I was getting towards with that was like, you know, we have to spend at a certain level all the time to support our scale. And I think that while that applies when you're at scale, um, it also applies in those lower moments. And like, you know, it was a big learning and a change of, you know, I guess vibe. I, I can't come up with a better word. Um, better find this thesaurus before the podcast is over. But it, it changes a lot when you go from a media buyer to, you know, budgeting for an entire year um, and then forecasting for an entire month. Uh, you don't really look at, you know, oh no, Facebook is down, you know, 20% today, like, what am I going to do? Um, you really just realize you have to keep that money in there and you have to keep moving. And profitability is always an issue. But that like finance conversation at the front of the month, front of the year is so important because if you don't have a forecast, you can't hit a goal. And if you don't spend into it, even when you're doing, you know, possibly the wrong thing, like you don't have any data to look back on and say, you know, I should have changed this. Um, so it's definitely a change of, you know, mantra uh, in my own head of, you know, stay the course and, and keep it going and realize that all of this stuff is going to build on itself. And, you know, spend that you put into Facebook 30 days ago, it doesn't go away. You know, there, there is a lag factor. There's a time value of that money. And those people still exist um, as, a, as a viewer. And you just you know, you didn't hit them with the right creative. You got to put it back into the funnel. Like it's, or you might not have the brand you might, cause that's the other thing about Hexcloud. You guys just have the, you have such a good product. It was, I was getting, Jason gifted me one a couple years ago. Just absolutely love it. You have the brand, you've got the, you've got the Gordon Ramsay in there as well. Yeah. So I think you've built, you, you're, you're part of an organization. You've built an organization on the ad side that, that really you can trust your funnel probably more than a lot of brands out there at this point, I would say. Absolutely. And I I think that comes over time, like with your products and like, you know, say you're just a a one man show trying to get up to, you know, two, three, four, five million, you know, it is doable, but you, you kind of lose the, the bigger picture sometimes when you're doing both of those roles. I think everything starts with product. Absolutely. Everything starts with product. You can't have brand without product. 
the one thing we know when our performance is down, it's not the product's fault. You know, it, it's it's not the market's fault. It's it's how we're marketing it. And that's not something that you can say about every brand in D2C is like, sometimes it is the product's fault. You got a bad TAM or, you know, just a bad product, you know? Yeah, no, or an also, it's an also ran, it's not truly unique, right? It's not a truly, totally. unique, right? We run into this a lot um, with, as we're, you know, graduating out of being what we think of as a small brand into a real big brand is you do have to have some of those performance versus brand conversations of like, hey, we're we're too big for this now. Um, we're not gonna take these, you know, small gray hat wins. You're not using sticky notes. Yeah, you know, we, we don't have to follow the trends, uh, you know, as much. Um, we wanna be relevant, but more than anything, like you gotta stay true to yourself. Like a brand is a person, you know, it's, it's about getting somebody to like you and once they like you, you can talk to them about stuff. It's, it's it's a simple sales cycle that, you know, I see in 200 emails a day or, you know, at a conference where people are trying to sell you something. The people that are really just talking to you and, and are winning you over as a person, they get that in way before, you know, maybe even a better product, but that's coming in really hard with the sales language. In your first introduction to something that's, in our case, three to six hundred dollars in, in uh in an AOV perspective, like you're not trying to go and close that sale right away. You just want to warm them up. And, and all of that really like, you know, chasing one day click ROAS might not be your best bet. Yeah. I want to get into, uh, there's so much, so many ways we could take this conversation, but you mentioned before you cut, you came from the agency world at Homestead for, for years working on multiple brands, probably more focused on meta, you, you know, uniquely focused on meta, I would imagine. So what's been the biggest change? You kind of alluded to this, but I feel like with ad agencies, there's always, you know, each department has its own objectives, but what really matters for a brand in a lot of cases is to unify them into like, how do, how do you make this all work together? So going from the agency to brand, what's been the biggest challenge in terms of that? I mean, I think that's like a, that was something unique about what we had at Homestead and you know, I started my career uh, in digital at Metric Theory. They got acquired by Media Monks. You know, I was like, eh, I don't, I don't want to be in this like big, nearly public company sized agency. And they taught me so much about what I know about like all over growth consulting. And when you look at just one channel and you want to win on just one channel, and I was a Google buyer at the time, you try and pick it apart from the other channels. And ultimately, you know, you're going for 10% of ad spend. So you want them to increase on your channel. But that incentive really never aligned for me as a person and like as a consultant, because what I was seeing was, hey, brand spend's a waste and I can prove it. And when I saw that, I was like, well, this 10% of ad spend thing doesn't really work for me because I'm putting in work that, you know, really like is a detriment to my billable, but it's really helping you as a company. And I think those kinds of changes in philosophy are really important as you scale into the brand side. I was really lucky to work with um, work with Connor at Homestead, um, and we always had a great yin and yang of like what's working, what isn't working. He's super bullish, I'm super bearish, and there's always that that trade off. And I think when we went in house, we got really lucky at Hexclad that they really said like go do. We like your philosophy. We like um, you know your guys's analysis and style like i think it's working let's let's prove it so when we came in we had fewer of those barriers to beat but i think a lot of these companies do and a lot of it is you know status quo you know best practice um isn't necessarily always best practice and there's no such thing as best practice in d2c when it comes to channel allocation or measurement it's all about your brand your vertical and you know even within a vertical brand to brand somebody might be way better going for Google, going for affiliate versus Facebook or TV or whatever it is. Like when you look at your competitors and I think uh, the marketing operators podcast talks about this um, in the, a couple of their recent episodes where they were like the whole mantra of like following your competitors and using them for inspiration. Like you don't know what's in that ad account. You don't know how that's performing. No. just because it's all over the place doesn't mean it's good. Um, and if they're going up against you, they probably have one tenth the scale totally. in, or, or in, in a lot of cases, right? You just want to make sure, you, you, yeah, it's hard to compare. It's like, yeah, even pan company to pan company. I would venture a guess, you know, our place, Caraway, their AOV is probably 
half hours. Um, you know, we just push a bigger set and it's slightly different consumer. So what we're doing might not work for them, you know, dollars and cents wise. You, you've got to find your contribution margin that works and the CAC that works with it and the time frame that you're going to back that CAC out in um, that works for your brand and your cash flow cycle and, and all the fun stuff um, that makes the heart beat. Otherwise, you know, you're just you're looking over the hedges way too much um, and you you back yourself into a hole trying to make yourself look like somebody else who's was at, at the beginning, you know, less successful than you were. So on your journey, you, you jump over to uh, tax cloud. What was your first biggest impact you made on the team? Would you say with, with what you were bringing to the table? The biggest impact we brought right away was, was this idea that, you know, Facebook doesn't need to be at a two X, you know, we talked to so many clients and they would just throw you a goal and they think of it as $1 in and $2 out. And, and it doesn't work that way. Uh, and on any given day, that 2x is is total vanity. Um, you know, the 1x is total vanity. It, it, it just is a an indicator. Um, so when we came in, um, we started moving towards a, I'm looking over at my whiteboard, more of a post-purchase survey style of budget allocation, where we know we have a really long sales cycle and people are watching these ads two, three, four, five, six times um, in a 30, 60, 90 day period that we don't want to be one day click profitable when we make a change because then we're missing all the people we might get later in the week from that same ad. You might be burning them if yeah. you're going too hard for the sale right off the bat. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're only optimizing towards that one day click, like you might be optimizing towards somebody that saw you weeks ago um, yeah. and, you know, you lost their their cookie. You're, you're just looking at Facebook. Um, that's a really, you know, trees kind of mentality. You've got to always be looking forward and say, I'm creating a customer today in 30, 60 and 90 days from now. That's what I'm worried about. And having the the finance capacity to say, I know that this is going to back out. And, you know, a, a big shout out to like Northbeam um, and the data science that they've given us uh, and the confidence that that's given us to like keep doing this. Because if we didn't have those benchmarks and somebody far smarter than myself to like go in and prove that out with like correlation coefficients and rigorous data um, all the way, you know, back to 2021, like we wouldn't have had the proof um, that we needed to keep going. But I'd say that was like a really big impact of like, I'm the kind of guy that says none of your ads are working. And Connor's the kind of guy that says everything is working. And when you combine those two, um, like for, you know, pushing on top of funnel, you get to have a really great conversation of like, you know, well, let's go and prove it. And, you know, I'm trying to prove my point and someone else is trying to prove theirs. And when you have that kind of constant testing framework of you need a data, need to find a data driven way to measure all of this, um, it eliminates so much waste and it helps you way better understand your actual customer journey. Um, and this was something that was a really fun part to talk about at the Elevar conference. Um, and I thought that um, the that Ron over at Rockerbox had a, a really great feel for this too, where it's like what you think is happening like from your ads is never reality. Like your ads are never being presented in a vacuum. Somebody is not seeing your ad, clicking it and going to purchase. Maybe sometimes that happens, but in a higher price product, almost never. And there's lots of offline touch point that is happening. You know, somebody might Google best pots and pans. They see our ad at the top. They don't click it. They end up on an affiliate article or on just a total, you know, organic article from the New York Times that says these are the yep. best pots of 2023. Yep. Or they're watching an influencer and they've got the pen. Yeah. They, right? they go to Instagram and it's a totally non-paid influencer. It's just somebody they like, like, you know, Salt Hank or anyone else in our influencer um, seating program that started to use our stuff. And they go, wow, like I saw that ad a week ago. These guys have it. And this other guy that I follow has it. Well, you know, let me go give that a, another another Google. And then they end up on, you know, Amazon and they purchase where they talk to their brother, mother, friend and say, hey, I really need to get new cookware. Like, what do you like? And they say, Hexclad. And you're like, oh, I saw an ad for them. Those do look cool. Like there's a lot of influencing touch points that don't happen in a measurable ecosystem. Um, and that's kind of that stay the course piece of like, you know, when you're winning someone over, you need to win over every touch point that they might have. 
Do you ask that in your post-purchase surveys? Because most post-purchase surveys are like, how did you hear about us one thing? Are you able to have a, like a multi-select where it's like select all that apply that, you, that you've kind of heard us through? We had that conversation uh, when we built the, the no commerce survey out where it was like, should we let them select multiple or do we force them to pick one? We decided to Last force people to click. pick one. Yeah. But we framed the question as where did you first hear about us? And a huge piece of that survey, probably the largest piece right now, is word of mouth. And next up is Facebook, you know, followed by YouTube, TV, TV show, you know, gets a little hairy in there because it's like, you know, what's the difference between TV and TV show? Like we're on Hell's Kitchen, um, we're on Next Level Chef, but, you know, we've got a great integration with Fox. And we really think that being where they think they saw you is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. where word of mouth comes in is like, well, how do we grow word of mouth? And in our head, it was fantastic customer service, you know, fantastic fulfillment, um, a great unboxing experience, um, like all of these things that lead to being able to be talked about positively. And the lifetime warranty plays into that a, a lot. Like if we don't honor that, you're going to get terrible word of mouth and understanding that, you know, these non-controllables, non-measurables are only going to benefit your, your measurables. Like, you know, if you did see us on Facebook, but you said word of mouth, like that's interesting. Um, because in my head, when you saw first, you said, well, the really important thing and the really big thing that sits out in my mind is, you know, my buddy said, I love that stuff. And if that's important, then we need to make sure everyone that buys is saying, I love that stuff. Um, you know, is that a community? Is it, is it honoring customers and content, giving out thank you notes to, you know, great longtime customers, like all of that stuff really adds into benefiting your marketing funnels because being just super efficient on all of your channels isn't enough to reach this scale. I just also just need to call out the fact that if you're not watching this on YouTube, you are missing one of the best dog appearances ever on the DTC podcast for both the sound and the, the imagery. It's fantastic. Yeah, putting putting sports right. D to C. It's riding shotgun. Super, super interesting. You mentioned a, a little bit about your influencer approach. Can you describe your philosophy when it comes to kind of influencer and creator marketing? Yeah, I think. That was another big thing that we changed like really early um, in the process. Connor and I had had a lot of conversations about like how do influencers, why does everyone love them so much? Because I've never seen them work. And what we kind of led into was we're paying them up front. They're poorly incentivized. We don't know how to brief their content because what we're looking for is that organic feel of like, I really like this stuff and I'm reviewing it because I love it or I'm I'm talking about it because I love it. And like a day in the life or, you know, that's of medium to small size even can cost like $10,000 for for a couple minutes on YouTube. And I just couldn't justify it anymore. So I was like, we're not even putting $10,000 of spend behind this. We're not getting the views worth it to like make a CPM argument here. Like, how do we appear everywhere? but lower this cost. And we kind of at the time thought it was a harebrained scheme to go with this like influencer seating. But in our heads, we're talking about, you know, 90s and 2000s movies where it's Mac laptops are everywhere in every cool movie or any time that tech is happening. It's like, oh, there's there's a MacBook. And as a kid, like it just was ingrained into me. I was like, if you're cool, you've got a Mac. And when I went to college, I really wanted a MacBook. No reason, you know, probably had less computing power at the time and was double the price. But I mean, that's exactly what you're selling when you're putting an influencer seating program out there. It's like you just want to appear like yeah. you're everywhere and like you're inception. A, yeah, you're, you're a you're a cultural <laughs> icon and, and both yeah. of us benefit from being very visually recognizable. I think there's some other cookwares in the space that are also very visually recognizable um, that could benefit from that. But we just said let's go with the you know the lower tier of people that would be really pleased to get a gift and we can send a smaller gift out put a note in the box and say we hope you like it no ask no nothing if they like it and they probably will because we know we love our product they're gonna use it and if they're gonna use it it's gonna appear in their content and 
if we can't measure it, fine, because at the end of the day, we can't measure any success, at least out of what we're doing right now, paying everyone. So when we move to that, like, you know, just be everywhere and send to as many people as possible, we ended up backing into, oh, we can use Archive AI to, like, find all of our mentions and, you know, adopted some social listening tools and grew out the community team to, like, say, hey, go and keep an eye out for content that um, that we're appearing in. Shoot them a follow up message. Say, how you liking it? You know, do you have any notes? Do you want to work with us any further? And then the people that are great and that love it, they tend to reach out anyway. And then you can go the route of like, hey, you know, we loved your content. Maybe we go with a little bit of a paid thing, um, but let's go affiliate on this. And, you know, if you sell a bunch of these, you're already using it. Um, But if you want to throw a link in there, go crazy. You can make some money on it. And that's worked super well and has helped us be much more comfortable with the profitability of influencers. Because beforehand, it's just like, you know, even on these bigger activations with, you know, big celebrities, when we try and measure them, they don't always work out and they're super sexy and people think that it's, you know, oh, that I bet that crushed for you. But much like, you know, Snoop Dogg and Solo Stove, just because it gets buzzed doesn't mean it sells fireplaces, man. And that's tough. And that's where you have to have that brand conversation, too, of like, was that a net positive for the brand of Solo Stove? Maybe, probably. But was it profitable? I don't know that they would say so based on the quarterlies. I don't think so. And I just have a harder time with those, you know, big splashes um, because I haven't necessarily seen anyone that necessitates them. We got lucky with Gordon. You know, I was going to say, I was going to bring up, you did nail it with the ultimate influencer with having Gordon Ramsay. And one of my questions was how, like how important is that kind of content? Like Gordon Ramsay content specifically in keeping people on the hook through multiple, because we live in an era now where you lose your cookie data in, in five days, seven days. Like, and so you've got to continually reset it on the device with, with content that people want, like how important has Gordon Ramsay content been to like keeping your customer consideration window open? I think incredibly. And I think in the different places that you get touched by it, uh, especially as we've scaled up, like if you're seeing Gordon on TV in an ad, and then you're seeing Gordon on TV in a show and you know, the top level of next level chef is hex clad. And then you see an ad for hex clad and then you're on Facebook and you see an ad for hex clad. That's you know, much more UGC, like applying to you, it really, really helps because his authority is just unmatched. But if we were, you know, shilling out for Gordon for absolutely everything and, and he wasn't yeah. like a partner in our business, I still don't think it would work. Um, yeah. Because we could never possibly afford, you know, such a such a person at, like at that caliber um, to be always on with us. Um, and it wouldn't have worked if he didn't absolutely love the product either, right? The fact that it was a game-changing product for him, it, it it wouldn't have worked unless that was the case. I guess the true onus of influencer seating was he already had it. You know, yeah. he liked the product before anyone talked to him. We can't take credit for for getting Gordon. That was that was far before our time. Um, but they truly just saw that he followed the account and were like, uh, "Do you like it?" and for some reason, they responded um, and that created a, a great relationship um, and a great partner. I mean, it, he's he's really like he means what he says and and he's like really in um, yeah. and he's a huge, huge bonus for us um, in everything that we do. You know, his CPMs on YouTube purely, you know, my guess is it's because he's the most entertaining face on the Internet um, that we get gifted far cheaper CPMs when it's uh, when it's Gordon Evergreen prospecting no targeting versus anything else Evergreen prospecting no targeting because um, I think people's expected you know hold rate and expected click through is always going to be higher when when Gordon's in that content because they stay super interested. Makes perfect sense. I wanted to add, I, I, we've been talking t- true top of funnel across a lot of podcasts and I know you guys do TV. I know you do YouTube, but I'm curious when it comes to meta top of funnel, are you selecting, are, are there instances when you're just going after video views or you're just going after real top of funnel metrics or are everything in your meta campaign always ultimately aiming towards a purchase? Everything in the meta campaigns is ultimately aiming towards a purchase. You know, we've run tests with like a YouTube views um, and reach campaign And I think you could back it into saying the same thing would be true about like going for the lowest CPM on TV. 
all of those things I think are understandable, like in the way that they are created as an idea. But for us, like, I don't trust any of these platforms, like as far as I can throw them. And if I give them the bone that says, Hey, just go, just go get us something cheap. They're going to go get something cheap and cheap. I mean, in my experience, CPM is absolutely like, it's a ratio of quality. If it's expensive, it's probably because that's a great audience. If it's cheap, it's probably because that's a terrible audience. And if I just let Facebook go and, you know, Google also like, hey, Pmax, go spend all of it. They will. <laughs> and, and, yeah, everything. Like that's a budget-based marketer versus a performance-based marketer. Yeah. And, you know, I'll leave budget-based marketing to the old school CPGs that are just like, yeah, we got 20 million. Let's put it on TV. Like go for gold. It, you're not going to have a clue why anything happens. Um, so we would much rather be purchase optimized and say, okay, you know, if we've got server side tracking and we've got MTAs and MMMs, like I can confidently spend into a top of funnel conversion campaign, knowing Facebook's doing its damnedest to get what we want out of it, like of that goal. And then I can set a benchmark to my one day click and say, that was good enough um, because we got our revenue that month. And then you can get really comfortable with, okay, I'm great at a 0.6. That's surprising, but true. So I think you end up shooting yourself in the foot when you try to go for these big, crazy reaches, um, unless you do so like with some like intent and you have a very low price product and you're really just trying to hammer out like, I just want you to know we exist. I think that's a different time in your growth cycle than where we're at. You know, we want to get dollars in and dollars out. Maybe there's a world where that that makes some sense, maybe not too far in our future, but I'd rather not do it with what I need to be profitable marketing dollars. Makes perfect sense. Uh, you, you, me you mentioned Connor a few times, and I want to have him on the podcast as well. How does the marketing department work? Sounds like you guys came over from Homestead. How does this gruesome twosome operate? <laughs> Gruesome two dynamic duo. Sorry, I mean dynamic yeah. duo. I don't mean well, that's, that's a gruesome I prefer twosome. gruesome twosome. <laughs> okay. That I mean, I I got lucky. Uh, Connor like really valued the the work that I provided like really for him um, when we were at Homestead. We we get along really really well and have known each other for for quite a while. But he was leaving Homestead and they wanted him to come in house, and he said, "I really think that we should bring Cam too." So I got thrown into the mix, and you know, director of paid media. I didn't totally know what that job was going to be for me. And now that I've gotten promoted, we're still working on like how do we align each different part of the house and how do we not be a two headed monster, but two one headed monsters? How do we go, you know, an inch deep and a mile wide on, on what our specific areas are, um, but still maintain like our level of collaboration. I think we both have a lot of the same philosophies and that has been really effective for us of like, I know that when he's going to make a decision that it's probably with the framework that I would have applied to that decision and vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. And having that trust like between parts of your organization is is generally quite hard to do. Um, but we got we got really lucky because, you know, we love working together. But as far as the organization split, like we're still on top of a lot of the same things. He's really focusing this year on like, you know, processing, like systematizing everything that we do getting much more involved in website, getting much more involved in, you know, just organizing us as an organization. And I'm getting, you know, more and more in the weeds with like, all right, these are the budgets we've got. These are the goals we've got. This is across all the channels. I want, you know, I want to teach our media buyers to to think and feel like I do. A small plug or tip, I guess, to, to folks in a similar position of like, it is scary to open up your data, especially to you know, agencies and outside partners, um, if they're doing your media buying, sometimes even internally, you know, you feel like your your secrets are or your your style is your value. But the more and more you open up and explain to people like how you're thinking of it and the whys behind what you're doing, the more they can start to think like that and, you know, be proactive in in the ways that they're optimizing, presenting ideas and and doing, you know, the work that you need to be done. Because you can't do it all with one person. Uh, you can't do it all with two people. Like we're no, absolutely nothing like without this team and without this product and without the whole organization like around us. We we get to chat on podcasts a lot, but like, you know, 
at everybody else at this org is also like absolutely brilliant and help us push through like truly everything that we do like doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I, I think as far as, you know, how are we organized? I couldn't tell you. Like we're we're still really fleshing that out. We've got a big offsite retreat next week where we're talking about like departmentalizing, um, you know, opening up everybody's bag of picked up tasks and roles and saying, does this all still fit? And should we reorganize a little bit um, just to make everything work better with the processes that you know Connor's building and uh, Paniota, our, our head of HR, is building? All of those things are are really you know bigger scaled tasks and a lot less like fun and sexy than buying ads. But um, back to buying ads, then I wanted to ask, like, what does your creative velocity look like on for on? I, I'm curious on both the the creative side and the post click on the landing page side for a product as as expensive as you guys with as many potential target markets. I'm curious about how you're speaking to your customers on the landing pages as well. I mean, our creative volume. We hired uh, Joanna Wallace, uh, she, former Tube Science creative strategist. Uh, she's our director of paid media. We brought her in like last November, so she just walked in immediately drinking from a fire hose. We brought on uh, two different um, uh, creative agencies. Uh, I'll keep them unnamed, but I'm, I'm sure people are are working with both of them. It's on a percentage of ad spend model. And I, I mean, last year it was like, towards November, we were doing like 10 a week. It became a little bit of a bear, especially as we were trying to build out also we've got our organic content team and then we want to recut that stuff internally. So we've got editors and freelancers that we're working with and sending briefs to, to say, Hey, take this YouTube video we launched a year ago. Let's cut it into a, a more DR ad. That process was like, I mean, it's still a little brutal and another one that we're really trying to clean up of like, I think we're testing too much. Um, you know, any more than 10 to 15% of your Facebook budget in testing when you actually have like perennial winners in there, is probably really skewing like what you can learn from it. And in our case, trying to learn in a long period of time, you know, we want to run something for 14 ish and then look at it for 14 more after that um, before calling it a winner. You know, we've got some soft, soft metric benchmarks, um, but really like finding out what's working takes time. And if you are always iterating and adding new creative to it, it's going to take longer and you're not going to have as long to run on the ones that you think are working. But, you know, maybe you want to add a little extra day or week uh, to say, is that really working? Like, or was it just a great week? And then for landers, sort of the same thing. I'm that's another one where I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a pariah where I don't love landing pages, especially if it's on a subdomain. I, I just think that the data loss, the you know, outside partner piece of like, oh, is this going to like look good in our cart? Like, are they going to hit add to cart and then it closes them out, takes them straight to checkout? Like, I don't want that. I want them to be able to browse. But speaking to people on LPs has been a huge part of this year as we launch new acquisition funnels on like new products. Um, you know, we've got aprons, knives, hex mills, pizza steels, and all of those, you know, we wanted to have a, a homepage for that was like, this is everything we want you to know about these LPs. And that creative, yeah, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, but I think with LPs especially, I like to be really additive to the content of what you saw in the ad beforehand, um, as opposed to just spewing out everything that you have and like really drilling it into like one hypothesis per product per page of like, you know, with the hex mill, it's a $120 pepper grinder. You know, what am I selling you here? Is it the best pepper grinder in the world? Well, if you already have a pepper grinder, do you care that this one's a little bit better? What I think we're really trying to sell on that page is you need to be using fresh cracked pepper. And if you don't have a pepper grinder, here's the reason to have one. And now you're going to say, OK, well, you know, what's 120 bucks? And this is a, you know, a trusted device that is going to last me forever. It's got a lifetime warranty. Like if I really don't like it, I've got 30 days to return it, I guess. But you're trying to not confuse people on LPs. You want to really have a one track mind of like, this is what I'm selling you and this is why, as opposed to that scatter shot, which you can kind of see in some UGC, probably from our brand, certainly from, from many others where it's like, oh, it does this and it does this and you could use it for this. And that's cool. But like, if I'm only one of those things or only interested in one of those things, 
I would rather see you say like, you can use it for this and here's all the things that that'll change about your life um, when you do so. And that person is gonna be far more likely to wanna go through all that content, wanna run into that funnel, end up really wanting it, than if you just say like, hey, we wanna sell this to everybody. Like, that's a very classic like sales mantra of like, you know, you can't be everything um, to every person or, you know, there's a thousand different ways to skin that saying, but I think that's kind of the strategy that we've taken on LPs is like, you know, you do want to touch all your value props, but you really just want to put your best foot forward on that LP and give your best sales prop, um, you know, the, the whole page to say, this is why you need this and tailor the creative to that. We've mentioned a bunch of your marketing wins. Have you had any flubs that you learned anything from? Oh man, <laughs> we should talk about these more. Um, yeah. We should just start a flubs podcast. I would say the some of the bigger flubs is in a lot of our bigger splashes. Um, you know, like a big uh, spend on a on an influencer and then it fails and then you just sit there, you know, twiddling your thumbs being like, well, I spoke pretty highly of that. Um, or, you know, a, a big miss in forecasting for better or for worse. You know, we had both last year. It was like we under forecasted super hard. So then we ran out of stock and that was 2023. And it was like, darn, you know, we, we weren't bullish enough here and then overcorrected and got too bearish. Then we ordered too much and, you know, said, shoot, like we were, we were just hoping, um, that we would keep that pace, but we didn't necessarily give it the rigor of, uh, of that we gave that first one because we wanted to insert this like extra growth into it. And, those kind of juggles, like, I think I'm very risk averse. And that's why sitting in my position, like, I always go for the measured outcome um, and the guaranteed outcome. And it, it's funny being a growth person um, that is very risk averse because growth is risky and you have to make bets. Um, I like to take as measured of a bet as I possibly can, but you can't measure every bet as well as you would like to. And sometimes you just got to swing and we've definitely missed. What are your biggest bets for 2024 that you're currently working on? Are there any places you're taking new, new big swings? I think new big swings um, are mostly on like newer channels. We're taking big swings at CTV right now. That's a, that's a measured outcome thing that I saw last year where I was like, our CTV is, is destroying our linear TV and I can see it better. I can measure it better. It's incremental to our traffic. I can guarantee that. And because of that, I'm I'm getting really bullish on CTV and we're putting a lot of uh, chips in that basket. Um, Why do you think that is? Is it because you can target better? I, I think it's you can target better. You can measure it better. And it's more digitally native maybe too. So that you're, that's more towards your, your true audience. Maybe. I don't know. I, I think that's like absolutely the case. And like, I don't think that all of the demographic splits that everybody assumes out of linear versus connected are entirely true. Like our customer probably doesn't look like what a lot of people would expect it to look like. It's probably skewing a little bit older, um, probably skewing a little bit wealthier. And in doing that, I just kind of was like, oh, linear TV, like older demo. And that's not necessarily true. Like everyone's cutting cords. And most everyone has a smart TV and most everyone has a Netflix account or a Roku or Hulu. And you're missing out on great measured inventory on an audience targeting basis when you just throw it onto, you know, regular TV. I mean, even a an NFL game, that's gonna be streamed and it's going to be linear. And if you're watching on linear, everyone that's watching on linear is gonna see your spot if you buy that, like, you know, the real non-local spot. And that's awesome, but you you lose a little bit of control of like, who is my audience here? Like how much of this is going to a sports bar and how much of this is going to, you know, a, an empty locker room in a men's health club somewhere and nobody's actually watching it. Whereas with CTV, I know, like I've got Oracle data that says 85% of the people watching this were 35 plus that spent $2,500 on their Amex last month and this and this and this and this, and they're interested in buying um, cookware in the next 60 days. And like, that's an audience based like kind of outcome, but I much prefer to know that about the people I'm serving it to 
um, instead of just being like, oh, NFL, like this is going to be well watched by men in their 20s and 30s. And they're going to love this. Like, I think linear TV and those pieces are amazing for social proof. I um, was just talking about this with somebody else where it's like being on an NFL spot. I've never gotten so many texts like everybody is just like, yo, like, I didn't know you guys were this legit. And that's kind of that word of mouth thing. Like somebody's like, oh, I saw you on the NFL. Like that's a real company. Whereas with CTV, like you don't always get that, but you could appear absolutely anywhere. Um, and you're speaking directly to that person instead of necessarily to the content that they're consuming. It's just a different way of thinking about it of like, you know, what do I care about more? Like being around this whole demo or being around specifically who I was wanting to hit and also being able to measure both of those outcomes, uh, which you just can't do with linear. Just finally, with such a long purchase consideration and with your really nuanced sense that this this brand has really allowed you to have that you've built out about investing now for eyeballs down the road, how, like, how are you thinking about Q4 and are you already putting pieces in place for filling your funnel for Q4? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's what all the budgeting is for. Like Q4 is a really unique period where it's going to be both your highest funnel clearing month, um, or quarter, um, speaking to BFCM specifically, like we're going to clear our funnels from the whole year in Q4, but we're also going to be creating the most one day click customers and first day. Cause like, that's the biggest shopping day of the year. So it kind of is like twofold where, you know, we want to fill that funnel and always doing so ahead of time. And last year was really difficult. Cause it's like, October is a bad month. Everybody's yeah, it was. You know, ratcheting down in October. Yeah. And I was just like, we can't stop spending right now because all of these people in this bad month are going to be buying stuff next month. So let's get in their head and let's start putting gifting stuff out now, not on sale, but just tell them about it. And in doing so, like you kind of create in their own heads of like, you know, if it's a month before Mother's Day is when I go, oh, crap, I got to grab my mom something for Mother's Day. And if I'm there a month before, am I going to purchase it? No. But when I see that Mother's Day sale hit, I'm going to go, well, I guess that works. Like I saw that a month ago, thought it was cool see it now it's on sale let's go so i think the the pre-sale and pre-q4 top of funnel filling is really important but then the during q4 scaling both that and your bottom of funnel up to both clear your funnel of new people and grab all those you know people searching best gifts right now in the bottom of funnel that are like really really you know primed to go and just finish their christmas list um you've got to do both at that time so you kind of got to get less efficient um, leading into Q4, probably less efficient than you'd like to be. And then maybe even spend a little bit more than you would like to in that period. Because, I mean, people are sitting there with their credit cards ready to go. And it goes right all the way to Christmas and like New Year's. And be, like you can, you can liquidate your funnel well through that period as well, right? For, for people that you bring in right at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And like hitting shipping cutoffs and stuff like that, like moving your offers over to Amazon once you can't fulfill by Christmas, mm. like there's all kinds of stuff you can do to like move your funnel around and say like, clear, clear, clear. Like this is your time to buy. I also think it makes a lot of sense to like, one, when you do sales, like be purposeful about it and always be thinking about Q4 in the sense that it's like, that's got to be our best sale of the year. That's got to be our best offer of the year across everything that we have, because we want to close everyone that we've spent on this year, this year, and we've only got 45 days to do it. So here we go. In those moments, like watching your ROAS can be scary and watching your Shopify dashboard can be scary. Um, but like you, it's one of those bets. Like you just got to do it. It's a good time of year to do it. That's for, yeah. that's for damn sure. And to and to and to be confident in in leading up, especially when you've got a strong content strategy that that continues, uh, so you can keep kind of refreshing that cookie. Yeah, and and consistent too. You know, like you don't want to be changing your value props all year long, and then you get to Q4 and you're like, well, let's only hit this one. It's like kind of to that LP point. Like what you sold me on in August, when I'm finally ready to close in October, November. That's what I want to hear. Um, so you got to keep your messaging consistent so that you s like remain the same thing to those people, if that makes sense. Because without it, like, you know, you're just you're switching your kind of brand. 
again, using the word vibe, uh, brand image all year long, you, you kind of fall into that noise factor. And, you know, if, if, if I see you differently throughout all these times of year, like, am I remembering you from before? Like, maybe not. Maybe it looks totally different. Maybe I must see Gordon in order for me to like, you know, connect this to, oh, that's hex file. I need him to call me a fucking plank. Yeah. <laughs> so we need some, you got to come up with some ads with Pete, with, uh, with Gordon dressing down people for having shitty pens or for using forks on Teflon or something like, which I know you can on, uh, on your pens. Yeah, we've got to, uh, yeah, we got to get him reading more mean tweets and, and being wild. People love it. Dude, we could talk all day. I got so many other things, but let's leave it here for now. We'll have you back on again soon. Maybe we could have uh, the gruesome Tucson on, on together or maybe I'd even something that. else yeah. in the future. But dude, this is super cool. Uh, go to Hexclad and get yourself a Hexclad pen because they're effing amazing. And then Cam, where do you recommend people? I know you you, I know you like to tweet, you like to LinkedIn. Where should people follow you? I mean, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, what's my at? Outward Opinions. Um, I'm on there as Cam Bush. Um, you're mostly going to get just foolish shit posting, but, um, I try to be constructive on there as much as possible. So hop over there, add me on LinkedIn, you know, do whatever. An aspiring Sean Frank in the, sh in the agency to brand to Truly. shit posting pipeline. Yeah. He is my mute. <laughs> That's amazing. Nice man. Well, this is super fun. Talk to you again soon. Awesome. Have a good one. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at directtoconsumer, all one word, dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.